I am Emily Johnson. I'm a career counselor in the Career Center. And if you are here to be a part of our interviewing to get the job with Baker Tilly, you are in the right place. We're glad you're here. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to share with everyone that today's session is being recorded. And additionally, I want you to know that closed captions are available by selecting the show captions button uh, among the Zoom controls on your screen. If you don't see the button, you may have to make your window larger or a full screen. You can also save the transcript script of our session by using the small arrow in the corner of the captions button and select view full transcript and it appears uh, next to the video. You simply need to select save transcript and then you have your copy. Uh, so as I shared, we are here with Baker Tilly with our presentation on interviewing to get the job. I'm so excited that we have Katie with us today, the campus recruiting manager. Um, and, and when Katie and I sat down to discuss what the session could look like, she shared with me that she had been thinking about the biggest needs that students have, um, and that comes around interviewing. Uh, that was at the top of the list. So I, it's a really rare opportunity that we get to hear directly from employers about what they want to see in an interview. So I'm so thankful that Katie can be here with us today to give you that insider information. Uh, so with that, Katie, I will pass the, the metaphorical torch off to you uh, to, to run our presentation today. So thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here. As Emily mentioned, my name is Katie Robichon, and I am the Campus Recruiting Manager at Baker Tilly. And when thinking about how I could best help you in sparking conversation and things like that, um, we just got through our fall recruiting cycle. And so the interview process is fresh on my mind of different ways that I could possibly shed some light to help you as you navigate this process. Um, we will go ahead and get right in. So this is me again um, in kind of my role, but I also wanted to explain some of my background. Um, it is a little bit unique. Um, I didn't originally go into the recruiting space or into the HR space. Um, I am a CPA and my background is, um, my undergrad is in accounting and then my master's is in forensic accounting. Um, so I also have done government auditing um, for the state of Illinois. I worked in industry at Wells Fargo. And then I was also a tax manager at Baker Tilly before joining the campus recruiting side. So I understand the shoes that you're in as you're going through your program, um, analyzing what to do next, where to use your education, your experience, and your platform, and how that fits into your career and the next step of where you're hoping to go. So here is a little bit about um, uh, Baker Tilly and where we've been and kind of where we're going. So the firm has been around since the 1930s, um, and now we are in the top 10 largest firms um, in the country. And so we have about 9,000 people in our team, and we're all over the United States, um, as well as offices throughout the world. Um, so we have local offices that have various service lines, and then we have some kind of boutique um, offerings as well. So this is a visual map of kind of where our offices are. Again, those full service offices um, versus the specialty offices. So we are primarily located in the Upper East Region, New York, D.C., Pennsylvania. Then we have a very large presence in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Chicago, and then as well on the West Coast. Um, but we continue to grow, which is very exciting because there continues to be more opportunities and more areas um, to expand your knowledge and your skill set. So these are the different types of um, offerings that we have. So tax and audit, a lot of people are very familiar with. And then we also have a consulting advisory space, which tends to be the area of largest interest for students. A lot of accounting, finance, and IT students are extremely interested in the consulting space, um, which we do offer that as well. Um, so it's kind of all encompassing. We are a public accounting firm. So you typically think of just accounting. But we do have people in, like I said, in finance and IT and all of these different various areas as well. So these are our core values. Um, and we'll kind of talk later on about why it's important to ask about this um, when you're going through the interview process to really understand what is important to that firm and how are they living out their core values throughout. Um, we can put things on a fancy slide and, and uh, you know, 
speak about them, but what's really important is that we're living them every single day. So the ones that really um, stand out to me out of our core values, belonging is extremely important to us as a firm and that you feel valued in your perspective, in your thoughts and the lens that you're coming to the position with. And I would say that we really do foster multiple mutual respect amongst teammates. That's extremely important to us, as well as passion. We want to know what drives you, what makes you excited, what are you passionate about, and how can you infuse that into your role every single day? So that's something that we really work together to really see what is it that you want to do and how can you utilize what you feel like you bring to the table and so that you enjoy your career. So these are the different opportunities that we have for students. Um, so we do have spring and summer internships. Um, we also have like seasonal tax support, very much as like a um, h and uh, block type of role where it's a temporary seasonal position. And then we also have um, full-time roles for tax assurance as well as consulting and advisory. That's kind of just a high level of Baker Tilly. Um, and I forgot to add this in the beginning, but this can be as conversational as you would like. Um, and so as you have questions, if you want to pop them into the chat, Emily's gonna be monitoring that for me. Um, and so we can just kind of address your questions and see if you have them. But I wanna make sure while you have me that you're getting the most out of this that you can. So this next portion, we're really gonna dive right into interviewing. Um, so the application process is very unique, especially for public accounting. So there's kind of two seasons, but we're always recruiting usually a year in advance. So sometimes it's hard to think about what am I going to be doing in a year? I'm just trying to get through this semester or, you know, through what's right in front of me. But it's really important to be planning a year and ahead and for you to know that all of your counterparts in the marketplace are also planning a year and ahead. Um, which is where it can become a little bit more competitive. So we have what happens during our campus seasons, and then we have our non-campus seasons. So typically we recruit in both the fall and the spring on campus doing meet the firms, events like this, classroom presentations, um, student organization presentations, um, meeting with accounting faculty, all of those types of things, um, ways for us to make really deep relationships with students and different touch points. So we would typically meet you at one of those events and then maybe have an on-campus interview or a virtual interview based on your initial interaction. And then from there, we go to two conversational interviews with our teams, depending on the area that you're interested in. So that's really what's happening in the fall and in the spring. And then in the summer and the winter, we're still actively recruiting. Um, but that's more of you would apply online, you would find our postings that way, and then we would do a phone screen with the recruiter. So a phone screen, the idea behind that versus like a virtual interview is to try to remove some of the bias that exists there once we can see somebody. Once we can see their body language and all sorts of things, we tend to gravitate towards what we're like and shy away from what we're not like. So we try to remove a lot of that by having it be just a phone screen so that we really can get to know you and who you are and what you bring to the table. And so that would exist again in the winter and in the summer, but then we would still have those two conversational interviews, um, which are video or in person with our teammates so that you're able to ask those really deep questions in the areas that you are curious about. So timing is, is very important and it's important to know um, the time that you have, let's say we have a phone screen that's 30 minutes or I meet you on campus. Typically, a recruiter is going to make a decision within five to 10 minutes of meeting you. And we try to remove the bias, like we said before, but it's important to know that as humans, we yearn for connection. And we try to find that connection and those similarities and those types of things. And we have a high volume of students that we're meeting in succession very rapidly. So we have to be able to make quick decisions based on those interactions because we don't really have, the time is not on our side in these types of situations. So we wanna make sure that those interactions are as impactful as possible. And it's also important to know a recruiter is gonna spend an average of six seconds on your resume, which is not a very long amount of time. So it's important to be aware of that so you know how to address that and how to make sure that your resume is put together 
as well as possible so that you're showcasing your skill set and knowing someone's only going to look at this piece of paper for a very, very short amount of time. So this uh, resume tip that I wanted to add for you is that your resume should adapt as time goes on. And so depending on if you have work experience or if you just have your education, um, typically if you just have your education, that's what you're going to highlight. Maybe you're going to highlight some classes or some technical skills that you might have from those classes. However, once you get um, on the job experience, that tends to become the most important. And that's what really should be showcased on your resume, highlighted. It should adapt to the position that you're applying for. So if you are an accounting background and you're applying for an accounting position, highlight accounting skills that you have. But if you, maybe you're an accounting MIS major and you're applying for an IT position, really focus on the IT side and the experience that you have there. So I know sometimes we complete our resume and we think, okay, I have it together and let me just dish it out to all of the employers. But it, <laughs> excuse me, it really should be a lot more adaptable than that in knowing that you want to tailor it to the specific role that you're applying for. So this is an example of my own resume. And the reason that I put it on here is because I am a CPA and have a lot of accounting background. And that's important to highlight. But when I was applying for this job as a recruiter, I needed to show the recruiting experience that I had and why it made sense. So you can see down the left side, I have all of my work experience. And again, I pointed out important things there. But on the right, you can very visually see this is the experience that I have related to this job. And here's my applicable skill set. My education is still there. It just moves down because I've had so much work experience and experience related to the position. So again, this is going to change and adapt as you have different roles, internships, or jobs that you have while you're still going to school or all of those types of things. But really thinking about what is the role that I'm applying for and how can I best show showcase my skill set that applies to this specific job. Um, I also would encourage people to look at the job description online and tailor pieces of your resume to match that. So if they're saying we're looking for a great communicator or someone that's really organized or those types of things, and you are those things, make sure to showcase that on your resume. Because again, they have only six seconds to be able to really look at all of the content that's on here and you want it to be clearly aligned so they're able to extract the information very easily. I'll pause there for just a moment just in case there are any questions from anybody. Okay, that's okay. We just wanna make sure we build in time for that. Um, so there's different types of interviews, <coughs> excuse me. And so it's important to know the different structures that exist so that you can better prepare yourself. So we really put them in two categories. So there's unstructured and structured. So unstructured is really going to be more of just a conversation between two people or three people, maybe open-ended questions, but there's not a set standard of what they're trying to ask or what they're trying to uncover. They're really just trying to get to know you. I would say that this type is more common as you're more experienced because they're really looking for personality fit versus skill set. Once you have certain accolades on your resumes, or let's say once you're a CPA, or once you've been in certain positions, there's kind of an assumption made about your technical skills. And so they're not really evaluating those characteristics. They're more trying to figure out, does your leadership style fit in the vision with the firm or with the company? Structured interviews are a lot more common when maybe you don't have as much experience, you're fresh coming out of school, or you've just done an internship or like those types of things. And they're looking more for how would you address this certain issue or how have you addressed the issue in the past? So this could be through case studies. This could be through like a, a pencil paper type test if it's a very technical role and they want to know if you have the proficiency in that area. A situational, which is theoretically, this is going to happen in the future. How would you respond? And behavioral is really looking at past behaviors. So at Baker Tilly, we really focus on behavioral type interviews that are also conversational. So structured, also unstructured, but primarily structured when we're at the campus level. So again, behavioral interviewing is really looking for specific examples that you have 
to develop or to demonstrate that you've developed certain behaviors or skill sets or abilities in a given area. So it's asking, give us an example of something that has happened to you in the past, whereas situational would be future. And some interviewers do focus on those types of questions. But really what we're looking at is what skill set are you bringing to the table and what problem solving do you have based on the experiences that you've had up to this point? So these are the types of common behaviors that we're looking for. And again, a lot of this you could extrapolate from the job description online. So it typically says, you know, we're looking for someone that can communicate, that is great at problem solving, time management, organized, teamwork. All of these are really common buzzwords, I would say, in the accounting world, because the type of work that we do is extremely collaborative. It's in teams. And accounting is a very technical role, but you have to be able to communicate that technical role. You could be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't articulate what you've done to someone, the knowledge becomes very limited. And so we want to figure out how can we effectively communicate what it is that we did or the technical side of things to our clients, to other people that we're working with, and to also show that you don't need step-by-step -step instructions to show that you're able to abstract, think about a specific area and how you would problem solve it versus I only know what was done before and I'm just using that as a formula. You can use past experiences as like a jumping off point, but you all always should be able to adapt in a given situation um, for the current issue at hand. So again, this is why are we doing this? And typically past behavior is the best predictor of future success. It's not always, you could definitely have a change, but in general, that's our best baseline at the campus level or at, you know, when you haven't been in public accounting for years and years, that's our best indicator to figure out, is this going to be the right fit for you? Is this going to be the right place for you, the right service line for you, those different things. And do you have the skills needed, but can you also communicate them effectively? So the problem solving, the communication, those types of things, we're not expecting you to be amazing at all of those things when you walk in the door. But we are hoping that there are some areas that you've taken, um, taken on as an area of focus as you've gone through school and you've really worked on things or other jobs that you've had outside of school and things like that as you're going to school of really giving you a solid foundation in given areas and being able to articulate those types of things. So it's important for us to kind of go through what are some examples of behavioral interview questions. I know we've kind of talked about it at a high level, but let's dig a little bit deeper into what are those types of questions. So here I have a couple of example questions, um, and I just want to point out a few things about them and, and why we would ask this. So the first one, describing a situation where you embraced a new system process or technology. I love this type of question, and it's actually a question that we do ask in our phone screens. So I'm giving you a front row to what types of questions we ask actually ask. And the reason for this one is accounting is ever-changing. We constantly have new systems, new processes, new laws. <clears throat> and so it's important that you can adapt and embrace that new technology and that new system. And so I'd love to hear about ways that people have done that. Again, it could be related to school or any job that you've done, but <clears throat> being able to articulate that is very, very important. <clears throat> Wait just one second here. Another one that I really like from this question set is to describe a team effort that was not successful and how you would have handled it differently. And it's very important to know we, in a lot of interviews, we hear a, a story that's very common and I'll share that story with you. So we ask about a team effort that didn't go well and kind of what happened. I would say like 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it was our group didn't work well together. The other teammates didn't do the work, so I took on all the work and finished the project. There's a couple of things that I would point out that that's one, not the best answer, because we want to see that you collaborated with your team, that you worked through the issue together. But the other thing is, is I'm looking specifically at a time when you weren't successful, when you did not fail, or when you failed, 
and how you came back from that. Because in the workplace, in your career, there will be many times where you fail. And what you choose to do after that moment generally defines huge pieces of your career. So I want to hear from you. How have you overcome that in the past? And what did you do? And what did you choose? So I understand the idea of not wanting to show your weaknesses or things like that in an interview, but it's very important to be real and genuine and authentic as you're going through this process. Um, and so that the recruiter can really see who you are. I would much rather have somebody that is real and authentic and I can see who they are as a person than someone who is very polished and has the perfect answers and everything on paper looks great or audibly oh, it sounded like the perfect answer. Because the truth is when you get into the workplace, it's extremely different what actually happens when um, people are faced with adversity and, and these different types of, of situations and things like that. So I would take note of these example questions and it's good to think through like, what would I say? I would not advise you to like work first the 30 second answer over and over again because I do catch that sometimes um, but really more so think about what example would I give and like why am I pointing that out like what's the underlying hope of showcasing this as the answer so when we talk about a behavioral interview we're looking at the PAR model so you're looking at what was the problem what was the action that you took in response to the problem? And then what was the result? So you also want to make sure when you're answering interview questions that it has a beginning, middle, and an end, right? Very much like a story. And we all have those friends who are great at telling stories that don't really have a point. And, you know, they'll just ramble on and on and they'll say, why did I say that? Or what was I saying? Or do you remember where I was going with that? And so you want to just be cautious when you're answering an interview question. You only have a short amount of time with recruiter or with the interviewer. So you really want to make that time count and you really want to make that matter. And so how can you best articulate what the story was? And again, thinking about what am I trying to showcase here? And in a behavioral interview, you really should be focusing on one of those core um, uh, the behaviors that we talked about before. So am I trying to showcase how I communicated? Am I trying to showcase how I had teamwork in this and these different areas and why it's so important? So another um, tip for interviewing is that relevant work experience is more important in an interviewing type of situation than classroom work. And I don't want to devalue what's happening in the classroom However, the classroom has very set circumstances that are more predictable than in a workplace. So if you do have work experience as you're going to school, that's what I want to hear about, right? An actual time that you had an interaction with coworkers or a boss or those types of things and really giving what your experience was like and what you learned from that. Um, if you don't have that, you could definitely use classroom experiences. Um, but just something that I wanted to be able to point out. A question that I like to throw in there is, um, and this is my favorite question to ask, is what would your classmates or your coworkers say about you? Or how would they describe you? And I feel like I get the most genuine, raw answers when people are like, oh, because I'm not asking how your professors would see you or how your boss would see you. I'm asking how your peers see you. And it's very interesting, again, how people are able to reflect what does that really look like? And what do my peers really think about me? Um, and it can be a much harder question to, to answer. So I wanted to highlight a couple of key, <coughs> key behaviors that are very, very important. And something that, it, again, I was a tax manager most recently at Baker Tilly. And so things that I wanted to see from new hires, from interns, new employees, those types of things. And one of those is definitely initiative. You have the education, you have the framework, you have the background, trust in that, believe in that, and take initiative on projects. There, you know, there's interns, there's associates, there's seniors, there's managers. And sometimes what happens when you have all of these types of people in the workplace is people always put the onus on someone else. Oh, they'll take care of it, or they'll handle it, or they'll read it. What I like to see is when you come out of the gate and you take initiative and you are thinking about things before they're told to you, 
Again, you are a smart and educated person. You have the foundation there. Trust that. Trust your prior experience, whatever your life experience might be, work experience. Some of the best ideas I have ever encountered have come from new hires because you have fresh perspective, fresh ideas. You're probably better at technology than your predecessors and things like that. So feel free to share those types of ideas and those thoughts, um, especially during an internship or those types of things so that you really are showcasing what it is that you can do. I also would say <clears throat> adaptability is huge. So in public accounting, especially, there's a lot of highs and lows. There's times that are extremely busy. There's times that are less busy. And we constantly use the phrase like, please be flexible. And really, I would say, please be able to adapt to a situation because you may go into work one day and you think that your day is going to go a specific way. And then it almost always turns into something different. And there's a new, you know, client problem to solve or um, the project structure is going to look a little bit different or things like that. So however you're able to adapt to situations and still have a positive mindset as you go through it, your mindset is something you can impact. There's a lot of things externally that you can't impact. You can't impact a client wanting something earlier, changing a deliverable, or all of these types of things. But you can change your attitude going into it. So it's very important to remain as positive as you can. And I understand that we all have times where things are, are not going our way and we need to be able to express that. So find a trusted person that you can vent to or those types of things. And then you let it go right? You, you had your safe space and then you let it go. Um, but, you know, in cube land, as I call it, in the workplace, isn't the best place to exercise those grievances and things like that. So trying to maintain as positive of an attitude as you can is huge and adapting to situations. And, you know, throughout your career, things will continuously change. And so it's very important to see how you adapt to all of those different situations. Being an effective communicator is also very important. And with this, I want to point out, um, sometimes people focus on language barriers or those types of things as an effective communicator. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is communicating, again, that technical aspect with your client, with your team, and working together, overcoming any maybe communication barriers that you might have. And that could come from Different generations tend to have different styles that they like to communicate. So some people may prefer an instant message. Some people may prefer email. Some people may prefer phone calls. So being aware and getting out in front of that, of asking your teammates, how do you prefer to be communicated with? And then being able to articulate how you prefer to be communicated with. And then figuring out a style that works for both of you. It shouldn't be you always have to adapt to them or they always have to adapt to you, but really figuring out how can we make sure we're on the same page. And I would stress over communication is extremely important, especially in public accounting. Don't make any assumptions that people know where things are at, projects or those types of things, because people are juggling multiple things at once. So if you can provide concise communication of where a project is at, it goes a long way for a team. And I would say that in itself was a huge indicator for me if someone was going to be successful or not, was simply if they were able to communicate where they were at on a project and working and collaborating with the team. And that can look like a various different way of types of things. Also understanding frequency. Even though you like a lot of communication, who you're working with might not. So again, trying to figure out what is kind of that sweet spot of communication and how can you be effective together. I would say this also extends to like feedback in the workplace and recognizing in yourself how you receive feedback the best way and <clears throat> how you communicate feedback. Sometimes people think, oh, I have feedback, so I'm just going to give it to you. I'm more of the proponent of asking someone if they're in the frame of mind to receive that feedback. Because if they're not, the feedback becomes very ineffective anyways. So making sure that both people are in the frame of mind to have an effective conversation. And then also to realize tension might be high and that person might need some time to process or you might need some time. 
And you have that space to say, I need a little bit of time before we go into this a little bit more. Can I have an hour? Can I have until tomorrow? You don't want to not address the situation, but you do want to give yourself permission to have enough time if you need, if you need that to work through as well. Um, one more thing I wanted to touch on was communicating your training style. Um, this is very unique to each person as well. And so, again, some people want a list of instructions. Some people want to be shown one time and then they're ready to go on their own. Some people just want to get into the system and do it themselves right away. And everyone is unique in how they learn. And typically a firm will have a baseline structure of how they train you. But then the onus is on you to get the training that you need in the way that you need to receive it and to be able to articulate that to people. So as much as we try to be mind readers, we're not. So if you can let people know, this is how I best learn. Are you able to explain it to me in this way or give me this opportunity? And then both sides will be much happier because they're both getting what they need out of the interaction. <laughs> so all of that kind of goes into being an effective communicator. So I will pause again here in case there are any questions. Okay, that's okay. We will keep on going through. So one more characteristic that I really wanted to highlight is critical thinking. And again, this is something that is very important to bring to the table of how does something impact something else? And you go to school, you get the baseline knowledge, you get that foundation, but how does that then translate to becoming an advisor to your client? So whether you're in tax, audit, general accounting, um, consulting, risk advisory, all of these different areas, you're an advisor to your client. You are consulting on an area and providing them with expertise. But it's not just looking at tunnel vision, it's the whole picture. How does this impact the entire picture? So for example, on the tax side, you're always doing the tax return like a year after the fact based on the year ending and then the tax deadline. And you're also thinking about what's happening next year because the client wants to know how is this going to impact me in the future? And there are some tax laws that are gonna straddle multiple years <coughs> of how it's gonna impact a client. So you don't want to just make decisions on what's good for this year, because then maybe next year they're going to have a huge tax bill and they're not going to be very happy. So you have to really think more high level as well as granular. You have to be very detail oriented in all of these different areas and really understand the technical components of that specific year or that specific financial statement. But you also need to be able to take a step back and see, but in the grand scheme of things, what does tax planning look like? What does our audit planning and our different um, generally accepted accounting principles that we're choosing, like how does all of that fit into the bigger picture of the client? And so if a new hire or an intern can really show me that they have that critical thinking of not only like what's the process of point A to point B to point C, but like why are we doing this to get from A to B to C? And that really comes with time but there are skills that you can showcase in your initial interactions, in your initial internship, or again, as a new associate, to show that you have that skill set and that ability. So here are some common mistakes that can happen through the interview process that I just wanted to be able to point out to you. Um, the first one is the we trap. <laughs> and so this really has to do with using we as a way to describe a situation. Again, I am interviewing you specifically and trying to offer you a job, not your classmates, not your prior coworkers, not anyone else. So tell me what it is that you did, how you contributed, your positive attributes, your weaknesses, not we or a group of people. And so the next point again is clearly stating how you contributed to whatever the question is and what skill sets you had. The other one we really see is generalizing, um, saying like, I always do this, I never do this, I absolutely do this, using kind of those extremes or the general terms doesn't really help me have a pulse on, do you have experience in this area? Do you have expertise? <coughs> you just say, I always do this 100% of the time. No one does it all the time, you know? So then, it lends my belief to believe that it's actually 
the opposite direction and maybe you don't do it quite frequently. Um, the other thing is focusing on the negative. So this does happen quite a bit where maybe you had a prior internship or homework experience as you're going to school and you didn't enjoy your coworkers or you didn't enjoy your boss. And I have had many times where it becomes like bashing of the boss or the prior employer or different things like that. And I understand where that could come from, but you can still honor the negatives that happened and how you grew from it and what you learned without coming across as negative or like you're talking bad about that prior employer. And it's important to know as well, in Minneapolis, in Wisconsin, like in this area, the markets are very small. So if you're going to be in accounting at all, right, not just public accounting, but accounting, it's important to know that you're probably going to interact with those people again at some point. And so you, you want to keep those bridges nice and strong. You don't want to burn any of those bridges. So again, being mindful about what you're saying about your prior experience, even if it is negative, Again, like what did you learn? What did you take away? And what were the positive things? Because there is always positive in every situation. So if you're able to focus on those areas as well, that's important. Um, and then again, another mistake that we see is really anticipating what you think the recruiter wants to hear, what you think the interviewer wants to hear. And we talk to a lot of students um, and we talk to a lot of students really close together. And so I would say we have a really good meter on people who are genuine and people who are not. And not that I think people want to come to the table and not be genuine. I think it comes more from they just want to do well in the interview. They're trying to land the job and they're coming from a good place. But it comes across as I can't tell who you are. And that's really what I'm trying to uncover is show me who you uniquely as an individual are what you bring to the table, what you want your career to be versus focusing on anyone else or any other type of preconceived notion of what you think I might want to hear. So really looking at what is the goal of interviewing in general, right? And the whole point of the whole series is do you want to work there? Do you want that role? And it's also for the employer to see, do you want to fill that hole? Do you want them to fill that hole? And it's important that both sides go into it with a clear answer. So ideally, you get to the end of the interview process and you say, do I want this role or do I not want this role? And if you don't know the answer, that's the only time that the process was unsuccessful. Hopefully, as you're meeting people and as you're putting together whatever information that you need to make that decision, there is a clear front runner in your mind. I would say I would encourage people to create that list before they go into the interview process. Because sometimes if someone is charismatic or they have similar interests to you or they went to the same school as you or those types of things, we can easily be swayed about our experience because we had that commonality and that felt really good. And so we were like, oh, I loved that firm. But then when you strip it down and you're like, I didn't actually like that role or I didn't like the team I interacted with. I only liked the recruiter <laughs> or whoever I met on campus or whoever presented to our class or those types of things. So if you create a list ahead of time and say, what are the things that I'm looking for in a firm and whatever those metrics might be. And then once you get the information from the firms, really comparing it to that original list not who you liked the most or who made you felt the most seen or validated or anything like that, but really like logically who had what you were looking for and then really pursuing that. Um, that's definitely what I would encourage people to do as they go through the process. And then I also wanted to highlight on questions to ask. Um, so the portion of the interview typically always happens towards the end of, do you have any questions? I would say leaving your questions until the end is important. Sometimes I've asked people that question in the beginning and then they interview me for 30 minutes. And while they get the information that they need, I didn't get any of the information that I needed. And so then it can be really hard for me to make a decision one way or another. Because that initial interaction, I want you talking 
like 75% of the time. I know that there's some things that you want me to explain to you as well, but I'm really trying to get to know you to see if it's going to work and, and go on to the next step. So I would suggest waiting for those questions to be at the end. And then when you're asking those questions, um, really think about what is important to you. So I get asked the culture question a lot. What's your culture like? And I appreciate where this question is coming from, but what I really encourage you is to relate it to what actually matters to you. What are you trying to find out? What about the culture matters? Do you want to know, do they volunteer? Are they really active in stewardship in the community that you're in? Are they really technical and people can like recite code? Are they really collaborative and people love to go to happy hour together and they hang out on the weekends? I mean, there's a lot of different things that could fit into culture. <coughs> and you should ask the piece that you actually care about so you can evaluate, do they fit with, with what I want or not? If I start telling you about all the stewardship that Baker Chili does, but that's not an area of interest for you, but you really cared about what our DIBS initiatives were or these different areas, and I didn't know that, then I'm not showcasing what you actually wanted to know or not. I also would encourage you to ask about pressure points in the team or in the firm. And this is really coming, it, you can ask initially as well, but also as you gain more experience and things like that, coming in and saying, what does the team need? And how do you see me fitting into that space? So that's like my favorite question. And I have had students ask for like real-time feedback in the conversation. And I've really, really valued that because it shows that they really wanna get better and they really care um, and seeing how they relate to the firm. So again, this is showing me that you have vision and vision of how you fit within the team. If you're asking me about what are the areas that might be a little bit difficult for the team or what are you looking for? Are you looking for a technical guru? Are you looking for a people person? Are you looking for client service? And then asking yourself, do I fit that role? Do I want to fit that role? I also would encourage asking about the training structure and the development structure. So how are you coached? How are you mentored? How are you built up? And like, how are you as an individual given a skill set to be successful? What foundation are you given technically? And then what's the on-the-job training look like? Really make sure that you understand that structure before going into an internship or an associate position of how are they going to develop you? Because that's probably one of the most common reasons that we see people leave an employer is that they weren't being poured into, they weren't being developed, they weren't being challenged. So if you can ask about their structure ahead of time, it kind of helps you at least go into it with realistic expectations of what that's going to look like for you. And then the other thing that I would really encourage is asking about next steps um, in the process. And again, it's going to look a little bit different firm to firm, the time of year that it is. Um, but I have shared what our process is at Baker Tilly, but that's unique to Baker Tilly. It's possible that other firms have a different process, a different timeline, but also understand that you drive the bus in a lot of these situations. And so if you know that you have multiple offers and you need it to go faster, articulate that to whoever you're working with. If you're a person who needs to assimilate a lot of information, you want to have a lot of touch points, you want to talk to a lot of people, that's okay to articulate as well. Like this is going to be a decision that takes me a while to sift through and work through. But we just go kind of with like a general approach and then we tailor it based on what it is that you need. But again, I can't offer you what you need if you don't express that to me. So <clears throat> a few tips that I kind of wanted to really leave you with is what do I think is the most important about the interviewing process? And like as a recruiter, what would I tell you? And the first thing is be authentic to yourself. Be true to who you are. And again, like don't try to be anything in an interview situation that you're not. I think sometimes we pull out certain characteristics that we think might be more successful in tax, more successful in audit, or those types of things. And really what I want to see is who you are. All of our teams we try to have is well-balanced and blended. And I value you and your perspective and what it is that you uniquely bring to the table. So don't try to be any else or, or try to assume characteristics that are not innate to you. For example, in an interview process, I had a candidate who said, I love client service. I love interacting with clients. I love talking to people. I love being on site. 
And then when they started, they actually didn't like those things that made them very uncomfortable and actually caused extreme anxiety for them. And we had other teams that had less client service or less going to the client. That was really the biggest issue was being on site at the client. And we had plenty of other teams that we could have placed that person, but we happened to place them on the team that traveled the most because that's what they had expressed during the interview process. So again, it's really important that you're showcasing what you want and your skill set and not experience. The other thing is showing enthusiasm throughout the process and that you care, that you want the role. Um, a recruiter shouldn't be asking you, like, do you want this position? Are you still interested? You know, like, if they're asking you that, it means they haven't seen enough enthusiasm from you throughout the process. And again, that can look different. It doesn't mean you have to be jumping up and down excited and like, oh, I'm so glad you called, you know, but there are little things that you can do. For example, when I call someone back, and they've saved my number in their phone. So when they answer it, they're like, oh, hi, Katie. Like they know who I am versus when I call and they're like, what firm is this? Who are you? You know, then it makes me feel like, oh, do you do you want this role? Like, do you care about those things? So again, it's those little touches that show, okay, you cared about the process and you want this role. And then also preparing yourself for, <clears throat> for the interview. So doing some research on the position, on the firm, on the office, really picking out like pieces that show you want that specific place to work for. And I know right now it's definitely an employee market where you have your choice of where to go and you're going to get a lot of offers, but it is hard on the receiving side of that to feel like, oh yeah, I just applied to like come firms and I don't really care where I work because I think you do care. And so it's really showing that you cared throughout the process to take the attention and the time to really figure out, do I want this firm? And not just because you were able to check a whole bunch of things in handshake or, you know, those types of things that it really was an intentional effort. Um, and to also have <clears throat> follow-up communication. So you want to keep yourself in their line of sight, in their thinking, in their foresight. So, Communi uh, communication after you meet them on campus, communication after you have an on-campus interview, communication after you have a formal interview, ways of staying connected, like your network is going to be the most powerful thing to open doors for you and give you opportunities. So capitalize on that. If you meet somebody at an event, ask for their contact information. Follow up with them on LinkedIn, connect with them there. I've had a lot of students connect with me there and They'll comment on like the post that I had for that specific school or, you know, these different types of things. And they really express that they remembered me or remembered the interaction. And then I'm much more likely to go out of my way to try to help that student because I know that they care. I know that they want to work where we're at. And then again, asking those questions, but asking those thoughtful questions, like what matters to you and how can you kind of uncover that through, through the process? Um, so I also wanted to um, open it up to Alan, I believe, is on the phone with us. Um, and so he has joined us. So Alan has recently gone through the recruiting process with us um, and interviewing and everything like that. So he is a fellow student of yours. And so I wanted to, um, one, thank him for joining and then also kind of open it up to him to share any thoughts that he might have on the process, on the interview process. He went through it with me. So if you want me to plug my ears, Alan, I can. Um, but uh, really just any insight that he has that he feels like might be helpful for you. So I will go ahead at this point and turn it over to Alan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I did go through the Baker Tilly interview process, um, and it just kind of collected some thoughts that I had, um, some advice that I would give personally. Um, one thing, a lot of this was mentioned, by the way, um, Katie did bring most of these points up, um, but these are kind of, kind of things that I would prioritize myself. Um, one would be to be friendly and express your interest. So... Um, that could be just being a good conversationalist, um, also doing research on the firm. That's really, really important, understanding like what the values of the firm are, as Katie mentioned, and um, really expressing your interest in that is pretty big. Um, also just 
being a positive person in the interview process like no one wants to people aren't as excited to like go through the process <laughs> aren't as excited about working with you um if you're not you know don't have a positive attitude so that's a really big thing um the other thing you know a lot of college students don't have a lot of work experience. Um, a lot of your experience is gonna be education. I know at Metro State, it's more of a, you know, more geared towards adult, you know, older learners, employed, you know, uh, uh, learners. But even so, a lot of people here still don't have that much experience. And I think that there's a lot of value in tying the experience you do have to the position. Um, you may not have, you know, tax or audit um, uh, or consulting experience, anything like that, but you can still, you know, talk about, you know, your customer service experience and how that's um, made you be, you know, a better communicator, um, how you can handle client interactions, that sort of thing, um, how you can handle a difficult situation, because some of those skills can kind of apply to you know, the role you're taking on, even if you didn't do that, you know, specific type of job in the past. Um, yeah, I guess those would be some of the biggest points I would bring up. Um, another thing would be don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. So if you have questions about um, salary, um, kind of the expectations of, um, you know, working from home or working in person, um, benefits, anything like that, definitely, you know, feel free to ask those questions. Um, certain things aren't disclosed right away and that's just, you know, company policy, it is what it is, but um, it's not like a bad thing to, to, you know, ask about what kind of job environment you're getting into. Um, so that would be kind of something I would, encourage everyone to ask, um, especially towards the end of the interview when you're asking about the firm and um, also asking about the, you know, interviewer and, and their um, experience. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, <clears throat> Alan. And I will say for me, right, like I said, we have a high volume in a short amount of time. And I can still very vividly remember all of my conversations with Alan and actually like where I was like in talking to him at different pieces because the interaction was so genuine. And I felt like I really, really got to know him as a person and what he was looking for and really able to evaluate, does that fit at Baker Tilly? And it absolutely is yes. But there was so much that he revealed to me like through that process and being genuine and asking the questions that mattered to him and those types of things where it sticks out in, in my mind. And that is a huge goal of all of this, right? Is to really stick out in the recruiter's mind, right? How can you set yourself apart from your peers or from the other people applying for the same role and being genuine to yourself so it can look a bunch of different ways, but be memorable for the right reasons. And Alan definitely was. So thank you so much for joining us, Alan. I really appreciate that you were able to share all of that um, with your classmates. Um, I also did see, I believe someone raised their hand. Yes, I kind of have a question I wanted to ask. So, um, I mean, last week I received, I applied for a job and then I received like five, I guess it's the phone screening. And I was told, I'm just gonna screen you for five minutes. And so I was dropping my son off at school so it wasn't really like a conducive time you know but I did take the take the call and answer the question so I'm just trying to understand like how do you handle such situations let's say someone calls you at a time that it's not convenient do you ask for a call back and then during that five minutes uh screening um because you're told hands on like oh this is just like a five minute screening do you ask questions uh, or how do you kind of go about situations like that yeah, and that's a very unique scenario to have it be that quick. Um, our phone screens are typically 30 minutes. Um, so we a five minute is is definitely very, very quick. Um, and so I'm assuming during that time they're just trying to get you to know you as much as they can in a short amount of time. So, you know, kind of showcasing your skill set, I would take priority over asking 
questions, just because again, you only have that little bit of time to really show who you are um, in that space. We also do it a different way where you choose the time that you can schedule it versus us giving you a time. Um, and so it's it's fair to articulate if that time doesn't work for you or you know that you're not going to be able to make that meeting to say, I'm very interested in the position. Is there any way that we can move it to a different time? Um, and I would say like most positions, most firms should be able to accommodate that. Um, in my opinion, if they're not able to, um, then that would cause me concern as an employee of just okay, they're not really willing to be flexible and work with me. So that's kind of what I would advise is um, asking for a different time that works better for you. And then also in that five minutes, showcasing your skill sets to the best that you can. I will just Thank add, uh, if you know you're job searching and or searching for an internship and you get a call from a number you don't know and you know it's not an ideal time, it's okay to let that go to voicemail. So make sure your voicemail is set up. It's professional. Um, and, and an employer is not going to get your voicemail and say, ah, they didn't answer and move on. They're going to leave a message so you can call back at a more opportune time. I definitely have been on the receiving end of people on public transit or uh, like you just said, Zara, dropping off your kids. And it, it kind of makes for an uncomfortable conversation on my end as well. So if you are uncomfortable, the caller is too. So just kind of, I would encourage you to keep that in mind as you're searching. Yeah, thank you. Now we are coming up to the end of our time together. And so I want to thank Katie and Alan both for spending time with us today. The information you shared is beyond valuable. And it was so interesting to learn about Baker Tilly, but everything you shared really can be applied to anyone in their job search, even if they're not exploring the amazing opportunities with Baker Tilly. So I have just a few notes to wrap up. I'm curious, uh, Katie, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat um, a, a URL for looking for careers with Baker Tilly. Um, and as I'm wrapping up, I'm seeing people put in the chat, thank you, thank you so much. So um, we're getting that great appreciation that I'm sharing as well. So thank you to our students for um, acknowledging the great gift that we got from Katie and both Alan um, and sharing their time and wisdom with us today. If you enjoyed this session, we'd love to invite you to our last session we're having for our career day, uh, which is about Financial Wealth 101, understanding the job offer with Upturnships. Upturnships is a, a internship program and they're going to give us information about salary negotiation and what a 401k is and, and all those questions that you might not know you have until you get the job offer. Um, so I just put in the chat the link for our career day so you can join us for that session if that works for you at five. Um, but I also want to give you the reminder uh, as part of our Metro State Votes campaign uh, that we would love for you to vote today. Polls are open until 8 p.m. this evening, and I'm going to pop a link in the chat so you can find your closest or your poll location. I also have to give you the reminder, register for classes. Early registration will allow you to find your most preferred classes. Um, so log into eServices right away so you can find the schedule that works best for you and consult with your advisors if you have any questions or concerns. Now, Katie has put in the chat the link for Baker Tilly job opportunities, and I just added the link for registration as well. Um, and so lastly, uh, before we give one more uh, round of applause, applies to Katie and Alan, I want to remind you the Career Center is here for you for anything job search related, which can include interviewing prep. Um, and so one of Katie's pieces of advice was prepare. Um, and so the Career Center is ready to help you with that. And so I have added in the chat our link to the Career Center, which also includes um, a direct link for how to schedule appointments. And I see Katie has added her email address. So uh, you can hold on to that. You can also find her on LinkedIn. And again, take her advice to connect with her. I want to encourage you send her a message saying, hey, I met you you or I was in attendance of that Metro session. Um, so you can start keeping uh, kind of a track of, of how you engaged and met with people um, and, and start building that relationship that Katie was just describing. 
So again, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Alan, for being here. It was great to hear from a student's perspective about the process. Um, and we are so appreciative for your time. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day.